Well, now the time that we have been waiting for has arrived. We're going to talk about the episode of SmackDown from Friday night, June 21st. That's summer solstice. Brian, that's as long as the day's going to get. They get shorter from here. Our days are shorter from here. But again, oh my God, could they have picked a better week to have a ball buster television show with major stars and big going on in Chicago where they were sold out at the old state of the former Rosemont Horizon. I recognize that back ramp anywhere. And <laughs> they're doing this when Tony is in disarray. It's this is a rout at this point. And how many people were there in Chicago? Do we have a an attendance figure? Uh, give me a moment. I'll pull something up. Because you know whose hometown it was. And uh, the only time I believe that Tony has really made any news in the wrestling business in Chicago was when he had Punk on his roster. And now they've advertised Punk, or they had advertised Punk for... Chicago, SmackDown, June 21st, and the, the, they open the program with the VTR from the Clash at the Castle where Drew got screwed and then quit on Raw over the thing. He's out of the company. He's quit. He's a sore loser, taking his sword and gone home. Do we have an attendance figure yet? Give me another moment, sir. <laughs> Well, the Allstate Arena in well, Chicago, Illinois, I, is located right there in the suburb of Rosemont. Go ahead. I could tell you the morning of 9.08 okay. a.m., I got this email from Russell Tix. So according to Russell Tix, 14,614 tickets distributed, 69 available tickets. Gee, okay, so, so they sold, sold out. out. Yeah. Almost 15,000 people. And as soon as they set the stage with the Drew McIntyre situation, it's Chicago and we hear, like Mussolini, don't need the Big Bang Theory. Because he's a lead in all his own. Here comes CM Punk. The big entrance, he jogged around the ring a couple times, the hugs, the handshakes. He made me a little nervous when he was climbing around on the rail. Like watch your feet, and they're st uh, they're they're chanting, they're they're screaming and blah blah blah. I think everybody knows that things worked out for the best because he's way too over to be stuck on the B show over there on the other network. So then he does the promo and he talks to them again instead of talking at them or emoting toward them or whatever these thespians these days think their acting skills are. And he said he still feels the pressure. You know, it's a live TV, hometown audience. He's still a little nervous before the, the record scratch and living color belts out, like Mussolini! I don't know, what did you think, Brian? Did he get the tone just right? You know, funny enough, I've never thought of Punk as a singer, but he sounds a lot better than you do. Hey! Well, anyway... He a trash. Like Mussolini! Oh, stop, Peter Brady. Singing at me. Peter Brady singing at me. Well, you know, he said, I wonder if I could handle the pressure. And then he talked about it was July 17th, 2011. In that building, he promised he was going to walk out WWE champion, and he didn't fall on his face and embarrass Chicago. He did basically drawing a compare. Drew fell on his face and embarrassed his home country. And but he didn't care because when Drew McIntyre kicked CM Punk when he was down, he kicked the people of Chicago too. So classic babyface promo, right? And. He said that he would make Drew's life a living hell and bury his career, and he didn't think it would be that easy. I was looking forward to coming back and doing some more, but now Drew has gone home. That and we and right then, Paulie interrupts, 
And he, and again, he's not the screaming psycho yuppie anymore. This is so fucking good. He talked his way to the ring, you know, like no disrespect. I'm not trying to come out and cause trouble. I'm, I'm running late. It's hot as balls outside. And, you know, when it, 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 Punk was sitting next to his kids at the Hall of Fame speech, and he told the world that Punk was his best friend, and he meant it, and he's here on an urgent matter. And they have a big hug. It is okay. Is Paul turning babyface? What this? Eh, the people were listening to this. They don't know what's going on, but they want to know what's happening. And Paul came out because he said that they heard on the radio that Chicago was Punk's town, and that pissed Solo off. And he said, now that Solo is... I've called him Alfred Hitchcock. I called him Zero Mostel, but he turned into Joe Besser here. <laughs> now that Solo is the head of the table. Oh, it was great. He wants every town to be his town. And I know you're about to be cleared medically. Well, if you don't get out of here right now, the bloodline's going to come after you, so please get the hell out of here. You didn't see the Joe Besser until now when I just said it, did you? Last night, I was watching the Three Stooges on MeTV before Sven Gulli with my kids, and I'm teaching them about the Stooges, and they like Curly. It is a <laughs> tough conversation with Where's Curly? <laughs> Who's Shemp? And then it's an even tougher conversation after they get used to Shemp. Who's this guy? I said, it's Joe. Who's Joe? I said, Joe Besser. I said, who the hell is Joe Besser? And he's unlike any of the other Stooges, less uh, physical, more uh, faces and dancing and uh, hand-waving. I don't know what you would say. I'll kill you a million times. Oh, stop it. But just wait till you have to get to Joe DeRita. You might better send him off to college before you have to go through that. Curly, I don't think Curly Joe's as, as offensive, especially to kids, as... <laughs> Joe Besser, because even though he's not the original Curly, he's able to be kind of like a not not kind of guy with an older Mo and Larry. With Joe Besser, was just a, all of a sudden became a different act. Besser already had his shit established. He wasn't going to yeah. change his gimmick. He you wasn't know. an unknown. He was. I mean, you know, Shemp had done stuff too. Everyone had done stuff, but yeah, Besser had been on TV. People knew who he was. Unfortunately, but back to this television program. So Punk Chance Breakout again. When Paul says, please get the hell out of here, and Punk's like, you're, you're serious? You're, you're really serious. You think I'm going to... And then Solo's music plays. And out come Solo and the Tonga twins. Tonga, Tama, Tama, Tonga, and Tonga Loa. And Solo says, if you want to be on my show in my city, you pay respect to me, or we'll fix it where you never get cleared to wrestle again. So what do you want to do there, pal? Had more big punk chants. And then punk asked Paul, he said, real quick, what? Because Paul had said, I'll do you a favor if you'll do me a favor. And then Paul's, and punk says, what's, what's the favor you want? And Paul says, take me with you when you leave. Oh my God, how <laughs> great was that? Because he can't control these fucking crazy Samoans now, right? So Punk says, Solo, I acknowledge you that I don't see the bloodline. I see fake-ass Usos and a phony cosplay tribal chief. And so the heels don't take kindly to that, and they get to the ring, and they have the face-off, and suddenly, no music from the other side. Here comes Cody Rhodes in the ring with two baseball bats and tosses one to Punk, and they're side-by-side. -side. And then the bloodline backs up and Cody tells Solo, leave your family in the back and settle this tonight. And Solo agrees to it. And there's Punk and Cody standing side by side in the ring in front of a sold out crowd in Chicago on the highest rated wrestling show in the goddamn United States of America where they are the two top baby faces. And over there in... Um, AEW land, they're going, well, what the, what the fuck has happened here? Yeah, MJF's working with Hechichero. Hechichero! But 20 Ult minutes Ultimo of this... Guerrero's working with a mask that doesn't fit, apparently. We'll talk about that at a later time, but... 
of uh, 20 minutes of this flew by because it was it was uh, people that are good at what they do doing it and we're interested to see who's on whose side and how this is going to play out etc cetera, etc cetera. this was a great fucking segment again again and you can't go wrong with with punk and paul but even still with the some the samoans and the the whole way they've and set the this up and the Tongans. They're not from Samoa. They're from the Isle of Tonga. Well, God damn it. They're, they're involved with the Samoan bloodline. How can people be related when they were on different islands before the days of mass transportation? Well, they're not really related. It's just that Peter Maivia was very welcoming to anyone from the islands, and that kind of continued the tradition of anyone of a heritage being from an island is welcome into the family. Either that or they were sending sperm from island to island in a bottle. Yeah, I don't think it was that. Probably not. But anyway, your thoughts on this segment? Great opening segment. Massive reaction when Heyman came out. Because everyone knows the history and they don't really interact those two on TV. Other than the Hall of Fame, have they interacted at all? I don't think so. So it was a big moment. And then the warning. So right away, you take it away from being about Drew McIntyre. All of a sudden, it's this other thing you weren't even thinking about. Brings out Cody. Establishes that everyone's kind of there in the building. You know, the Heyman line, take me with you. I loved it. It's interesting that, you know, he did that in Solo Sokoa and them heard him do that. Yet, he, you know, he still did that. A great opening segment. And, you know, we didn't know where things were going to go. It was a promising start to SmackDown. Well, as a matter of fact, going out of order, let's let's stick with the bloodline because it'll be more coherent because they're back and forth through this program. And then we'll come back and get some of the, the other things that happened. But in the back a little bit later on, Solo was looking at Paul with that menacing look. And he's asking, oh, so you want to leave? You want to lay and Paul's, you know, the, the lip is quivering. And he tells Paul, you go out there, you tell the Tongans that Owens and Orton, and then they muted his audio. And from his lips, you could see that he said, Owens and Orton don't make it. And then something. You think, did he? Did he flummox a line and they didn't have time to redo it and they muted it? Why would they mute something that he's not committing profanity in? I don't know because they obviously have tried to get profanity, but there's also times where either they mute or the TV screen just goes black and I'm never exactly sure why or what caused it. Well, the, the black screen, I'm thinking that maybe somebody was flipping a bird or something and they're really being careful, but this was a mute on a backstage interview. It didn't make sense, but it, the story was you tell the Tongans that Owens and Orton can't make it to whether it be money in the bank or can't make it to whatever the fuck, the main event tonight. And Paul's like, me, tell them. You better tell them, and then you and I need to talk. So then... Later on, there's a Money in the Bank qualifying match with Randy Orton versus Carmelo Hayes versus Tama Tonga. That goes through the 9 o'clock hour. And I'm thinking, you know, for one thing, gee, many Pete, Hayes, I don't know what they see, but Orton does the double draping DDT to both of them and goes for an RKO, and Tonga Loa pops up on the apron. Orton spins around and nails him, and Owens gets on Tonga low on the floor, and then Orton shit cans Tama Tonga, and suddenly Hayes schoolboys Orton from behind one, two, three. But then, okay, this only makes sense if Carmelo Hayes goes to the multiple man money in the bank ladder match. Who gives a shit? They're keeping Orton out of the money in the bank thing so they can put him in a main event deal with the bloodline. Okay, that makes sense. But nevertheless, then the main event, Cody and Solo settling things. Well, I'm sorry, did you have any comment about that match or do you give a shit? 
No, let's go it's to just the main furthering event. what's going. Okay, let's go to the main event. The main event. Paul and Solo are in the back while Cody makes his entrance, and Paulie's telling him, "Hey, I I told the Tongans they took care of business earlier because of." Uh, during the I'm sorry, during the qualifying match with Owens against Waller and Andre, the Tongans jumped Owens and kicked the shit out of him. And so anyway, as a matter of fact, Owens lost also because uh, Andre stole a fucking victory when he was distracted. So Owens is out of the money in the bank thing too for a main event match with the bloodline. But then it's Cody and Solo. And Paul says, I told the Tongans they took care of business. And then he reveals Roman Reigns had agreed that CM Punk was hands off because of he's personal to me. And Cody is not supposed to be handled by you. He's supposed to be kept in check until Roman Reigns gets back. And Solo stops him and says, I hate to tell you this, wise man, but Roman's not coming back. And then he turns and starts walking to the ring and Paul's like, how can this be? How can this be? So at that point, now we don't know what the fuck's going on. And then the match starts with eight minutes left on the air. So I'm saying, what the fuck? They open hot. Solo, by the way, is doing those phony-looking open-handed slap punches like the Usos do, and it drives me crazy. And after about a minute on the floor bouncing around, they go back in the ring, and the Tongans hit for the disqualification to start jumping on Cody. And Orton's music plays. And here comes Orton and Owens. And they hit the ring, kind of have a lackluster six-way and they dump the Tongans, and then Solo is in the corner with the three faces, and he begs off, and the, and he's starting, you know, please, please, and then he laughs, and he laughs louder. And then suddenly in the ring from behind is Jacob Fatu under that name. The Samoan werewolf, oh, werewolves of Samoa. Oh! And now you see that didn't sound like a wolf. That second one, that sounded like a little oh. dog. <laughs> but now you see how to get over. He fucking he throws the super kicks. He clotheslines Owens. Owens takes a hell of a bump. He throws him out to the floor. He Samoan drops Owens on the stairs. Then he runs around the ring and spears Orton through the fucking barricade. Then he grabs Cody and gives him a rock bottom on the apron and then clears off the desk and puts him on the desk, goes to the top rope and dives from the top rope to the announce desk with a splash and demolishes the whole goddamn thing. And then they all get, he's wiped out the top three baby faces. And then they all get in the ring and the bloodline and put up the one finger. Now you got two Tongans, you got Solo, and you got Jacob Fatu, the Samoan werewolf. And he's lost weight. He looks in great shape. From five years ago at MLW, I bet he's lost 40 pounds because he was wide and thick and still doing that stuff. But for longevity of his career and his health, the shit that he does, he, need, he needed to lose a little weight. But he still, he plays big. He's not, I don't know how tall those other guys are, but I've stood next to Jacob. He's my height or maybe an inch or two shorter. But he plays big in the ring. He looks big. He takes up his space and the facials. The fa he, This guy looks out of control. He's got the weird fucking multicolored hair. He's got the scraggly facial hair. Remember, I, I, I've been talking about Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa, but fine, great. They look too clean. They look too normal. You can believe that they got this guy out of either a jail or a nut house. 
And he hasn't even done his best stuff yet. And and I know somebody's going, oh, Cornette, for a, for a fucking guy who hates just moves, moves, moves. Now you're talking about the guy's moves. Yes, I'm talking about a goddamn personality that can come in and get over like a fucking maniac that can do jaw-dropping shit while he's doing it. That's the key. He doesn't look like a goddamn 16-year-old nebbish from science class. He looks like somebody that will eat your fucking pet dog. So, I mean, again, he looks great, but still not too clean. He's crazy. And you saw Paul in the background covering his eyes, and he, he's, he's scared of these people. And now I'm just thinking, you got Solo, you got two Tongans, and a Jacob Fatu. Well, you got a couple of Usos, wherever Jimmy is. You've got Roman Reigns, and they just signed Hikalula? Hikaleo. They signed Hikaleo. They trademarked the name uh, Tala Tonga, I believe. I saw something else that said they trademarked I think Caesar Sokoa. Right before I saw Jacob Fatu debut, so I was like, oh no, don't change his name to that. We'll see. I mean, the other interesting thing is, and it may make it, eh, I don't know. If you needed a fourth person, if you're just going based on that, Solo, Jacob Fatu, the Tongans, Roman Reigns, a reunited Usos. Remember, Sami Zayn was a big part of that story for a long time. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not denying that, and I would imagine Sami Zayn would probably be a bigger star, more over than a new guy they're bringing in fresh, but it has to be all bloodline, doesn't it? Doesn't it have to be the, the, the inner struggle for power in the... He was an honorary oos for the record, but... Oh, I God damn point. it. I get your point. I get your he's, point. he's not just white, he's translucent. Still, it, it's, you know, it's it doesn't look the same. I said honorary, I didn't say... Uh... Well, he could be, he can be honorable all he wants to be. But anyway, so we got the werewolf. He got him, he looked like a million bucks. They made him, they, they put him over big time on commentary as it was happening. By name, oh my God, look at what he's doing. And the Tongans, the moment at the end where they walked up and Solo and Jacob are at the front and they all do the one finger, the Tongans almost looked like worried or... Yes, they were looking at him sideways like, oh shit, this fucking guy showed up now, we might be in trouble. And if they really wanted to like, you know, build it up, just make it real. This guy has a record. This guy's dangerous. WWE was scared to go near him. What is he doing here? That sounds familiar. Didn't I say that a couple months ago? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And then the question now becomes Roman. What happens with Roman? How many more people are going to get introduced into this? And when does Roman return? What is Roman doing? We haven't heard anything about, is he making a movie? Is he sick? I don't know where well, he is. Well, no, he, he got on his plane after WrestleMania and he flew somewhere. And apparently he's going to be there until he decides to come back. With no phones or, or uh, TVs or anything, any form of Apparently. And that's the thing. You know, you can get away with having no TV, but no phone. Yeah, especially to Heyman. Poor Heyman. He's like waiting yeah. by the phone. He's got a good plan. Call Roman Reigns. No answer. How much do you think Paul Heyman pays for that fancy Dan voice-activated telephone service and plan he's got there. Oh, I'm fairly certain no matter what it costs, he turns in a receipt. Oh, well, I'm pretty sure he turns in a receipt, even if it didn't cost anything, but <laughs> that's the Paul Heyman way. However, I bet you he's overpaying because I bet you that while he's been living on the island of relevancy and trying to deal with all of these warring Samoan factions, he hadn't been keeping up on the fact that you don't have to pay a fortune anymore for a good telephone plan. Now, for example, if, if Paul E. was with Mint Mobile right now, then when all that happened, he could have got on that telephone and he could have said, call Roman Reigns because the Samoan werewolf is in town, and boom, because Mint Mobile gives you a high-speed data and unlimited talk and text plan for only 15 bucks a month when you get the three months. 
Well, immediately Roman would have known he could have flown back here, straightened this whole thing out. But now we've got to wait through SummerSlam and maybe Survivor Series, maybe even Royal Rumble, all the way to next year's WrestleMania to see how this is going to work out just because Paul E is ignorant that you can get an unlimited plan for $45 for three months from mintmobile.com. Well, for the record, we don't know how ignorant he is about his phone plan. We don't know what his phone plan is, so we can't really overly speculate. He may already be taking advantage of such great If news. he had unlimited stuff, he'd be able to talk to Roman. That's the problem. They keep cutting. He's on that phone all the time. He's draining his battery. He's using up his, his plan minutes. It's not unlimited. You can tell. I'm telling you. Mint Mobile could be the answer to Paul Heyman's, but what kind of wise man would not be making themselves go now to get the Mint Mobile plan three months, $15 a month, $45 in total for a quarter of the year with all of these premium wireless service. Bring your own phone number. You can bring your own phone. Hell, bring your own bottle. You can do all of those things with Mint Mobile. They don't care. If they don't care. You don't need to bring it anywhere. You can just stay home and do all these things. Stay home and drink, folks. Well, just that's not what I'm saying. I'm not drink. saying that either. Don't miss And a lot during the day. Get started early in the day. Ladies and gentlemen, responsibly when uh, you're in a responsible zone and mood. But let's get back to Mint well, Mobile. Well, because if you start drinking early in the day, then by the evening time, you can use your unlimited text and data plan to start sending risque pictures to everybody in your phone list what what, they, what are you Mobile drinking that would cause you to be that crazy well i did uh, thunderbird oh there you go mintmobile.com slash jce is the the code you need to use and you will get a three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 dollars a month of course that's 45 dollars for the three months that's simple math and that's the way it works out so you can cut your wireless bill now at mintmobile.com slash JCE, the $45 upfront payment is required because we don't trust any of you assholes. New customers on the first three-month plan only. You can't heal back in after you try to just get this special deal constantly. We're on to your game. Speed slower above 40 GB on the unlimited plan, but additional taxes, fees, and restrictions may apply, but you can see Mint Mobile for all the details, they'll give you the scoop. They'll tell you what you need to know, and then you just give them your money and start sending pictures of your genitals to everybody in town. Don't do that. And this is no guarantee that you would. And of course, you wouldn't under normal conditions. And don't if you could with Mint Mobile. But you will if you do, but you can't, so you won't. And you won't. So once again, you won't. But here's that promo code for those who. Want to just get a wonderful phone who plan? Want to, who want to and will? <laughs> Mintmobile.com slash JCE. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Yes. Well, back to SmackDown. So they had a Money in the Bank qualifier, Bianca and Chelsea and Mia Yim. I don't care. And then we come to another situation where they were in the back, Brian. And there was Grayson Waller doing a promo, and our boy Austin Theory is home. I hope he's not hurt now. But he was talking about tonight's Money in the Bank match, where he was going to be doing this and that and the other thing. And then here came Tommaso Ciampa and Johnny Gargano, a.k.a. Johnny Sameface, and they were venting their frustrations at each other when suddenly there was a knocking on the garage door behind them. What the fuck? And somebody opens up the garage door and there is Drew McIntyre standing over CM Punk's bloody body, laying at his feet. And he jerks him up and Fireman's carries him and he carries Punk unconscious and bloody into the building, through the gorilla position, and into the arena, and the people are booing the shit out of him. And the game face that Drew had on was like, this, yeah, I've got your hero. Looked like one of those goddamn medieval people 
in the medieval movies. What are the medieval movies? The goddamn medieval times, the, the jousters. The medieval people, sure. The medieval people. I've got your king. And he and he, he dropped him in the entrance way. And the way he dropped him, I was like, fuck, it looked like Punk almost broke his other elbow. And then he knelt down, Drew McIntyre did, and jerked a bracelet off of Punk. And then here comes Aldous and the referees and the agents, and Aldous shoves McIntyre back, and McIntyre shoves Aldous and gets a pop. So now they've even got the authority figures over. And they exchange harsh words, and and Punk was let his bleed. McIntyre has bloody knuckles. Punk has blood from his mouth and on the side of his head. And I got to give it to him. I'm pretty sure he probably didn't go back in the parking lot all by himself and get fucking juice and gig his tongue or whatever. This was probably a little Hollywood blood, but it looked better than I've ever seen the Hollywood blood look, didn't it, to you? Yeah, I thought it looked really good. It was actually more graphic than most of the blood you would see on TV from WWE. Him sitting there just gurgling up the blood a little bit on the ground, not sitting there laying there. Yeah. Yeah, it was something. So this this looked halfway fucking decent. If you're going to have the the Hollywood blood, at least do it right. The faces and of everyone as Drew McIntyre was walking through the back out to the arena, just all the different people, like everyone sold it. Everyone's face sold it. It was good. And then they they immediately, the referees and agents are down there and they, they bring out EMTs with a backboard. They go to the break. They come back. Well, here's what happened. He's been taken out in an ambulance and punk, psh, load him in the meat wagon and off they go. So what is the date of SummerSlam? At the, do, we, do we remember what date SummerSlam is going to be presented this year? Saturday, August 3rd, 2024. SummerSlam. Feel the heat. Well, son of a gun. It's only about seven weeks away now. Right? Not even. Six weeks, maybe. So remember what I said? You asked me, you said, well, shouldn't Drew get something back on Punk? And I said, I... Yes, but I would hold on until I could be reasonably certain that I'm going to be able to promote the match before it would get stale, right? I have a feeling they've got their date, and they decide it won't be stale between now and then. And I think this is perfect because now he's got time to recuperate from this beating and come back and freshen this thing up, and I have a feeling, and we'll probably see these two uh, at SummerSlam. I mean, the timing's perfect. The timing's perfect. This has been built up great for months now. It's interesting. You can't wait to see where it's going to go. And, you know, other than the matches, and it just feels like a cop-out when it's just non-stop three-way matches, just like it does with AEW. WWE needs to be called that for, too. It feels like a cop-out yeah. on these shows when that's all you see. Let's just get everyone out there in multi-man matches. Beyond that, the angles on this show, the promos on this show, this is a good wrestling show. And considering the week it happened, that all of this happened, not just with AEW having that record low rating, but they did an angle to end this show where the baby faces were completely beat down by a new crazy heel in the top heel stable, as opposed to Raw, which this week ended with a new supernatural heel stable killing the roster. <laughs> I said to you the other day, I wish there was a zone in WWE safe from that kind of stuff. Hopefully SmackDown will be, because this is an example of what could be a great SmackDown. See, we, we like the werewolf better than the Wyatts because the werewolf is not actually a fucking werewolf. His face, just whoa, when they were doing the close-ups of his face, he looks like a maniac. This is going to be that's, great. That's how you make an impact with people. That's how you get a new talent over. They've got to come out and show what they... And, you know, again, between how much you think they spent for Jacob Fatu and how much you think Tony spent for Okodi or for Will Ostrich. Well, here's the big question, and I don't even think you could talk about Okada in this sense because... 
Whether you like him or not, he's kind of a non-entity there right now. But Osprey, there's something there. Who's more over, though? Osprey's like super over with that fan. Well, super over. He's over enough that the people that are there are into him, but no one's coming out extra. But not just Jacob Fatu, first night in. Even Tama Tonga. He was kind of not one of those names coming out of New Japan that people talked about. I've seen the reactions he's gotten on these shows. He's more over, certainly, than Okada is with the AEW fans, I think. Well, yeah, and the thing is, it's, again, it's not necessarily all talent. It's not all the talent of the individual. It's how they are presented. It has to be both. And the point I was making with how much did these guys cost Tony versus how much they probably signed Jacob Fatu for because he... Never been on tele. I'm sure they didn't rape him or anything. I give him a field hand contract for heaven's sake. But and by the way, Tony could have had him at any point if he really wanted him. Of course, that's what I was saying from the yeah. start with Tony five years ago. He's a billionaire. When you don't have restrictions on how much money you could spend, why are you using substandard indie outlaw talent that's not ready for a major television production? And the point is in. Two minutes, they made Jacob Fatu, who didn't cost millions of dollars, have a bigger impact and get over to a wider audience than they did in AEW with Okodi and with Will and with Mercedes. And it didn't cost nearly as much. It is, it, the returns are immense because it's how you present it. He came off as a dominant end of dangerous individual and the other people come out and have mediocre to okay wrestling matches in Mercedes's case, not that. And in, in a couple of their cases, the promos of the shits too. And it took will 15 or 20 minutes to beat everybody. I've seen him in the ring with. So that's the difference. You want to make a star, he's got to look like a star, and he's got to act like a star. And they made a star with Jacob Fatu, and they've elevated these other guys also because they've taken people that the fan base had no preconceived notion of because they hadn't seen them before, and they presented them as top individuals to watch out for, and everything they're involved with makes enough sense, and they interact with other main event level talent that people know. So boom, that's what they are. Or they can come out and be competitive with fucking underneath middle card and unknown guys for 20 minutes and wander around twisting in the wind on promos because they don't know enough to do their own. And that's what you get there. What if Roman comes back and pleads with these baby faces to help him, the ones that were attacked here? And he uses it to turn on Cody. Trick him the same way Dusty was tricked. No, because then you ruin Roman. See, that's the other question. Do you think Roman is more valuable as a babyface? Or do you think, even with all the chance and everything, his true value, especially if he's going to work this kind of schedule, is as a heel? Well, it, his, right now, his value is as a babyface because the people want him back so bad and they're setting up that these other people have usurped his throne but you wouldn't have him come back in a angle specifically to turn on Cody because then if he joined these other motherfuckers, then you got like six of them. Well, then, then the same thing, the problem they're going to have with the Wyatts. How many top fucking baby faces are you going to tie up trying to fight these fuckers? And, and it would, it would, it would piss people off because they Roman had heat. They wanted Roman's reign to come to an end. And it did, but now other people have replaced him in terms of the people that the fans have heat with, and they're wanting to see Roman come back and straighten it out. He needs to come back and at least attempt to, in good faith, straighten it out, and then a year down the road after that, maybe. But then, by that point, he's making movies or whatever he's doing anyway. But he needs to come back and be a baby face if they're going to do this. Again, if he's doing that, this is one of those things like, you know, Shane Douglas is going to be a doctor that we've been hearing for a while. <laughs> Roman Reigns is going to go make movies. There haven't been any movies yet. Shane was going to be a doctor, wasn't he? Remember that? He used to be like, you know, I don't need the business. I could 
I'm gonna, I can go be a doctor. <laughs> then why do you end up working at Walmart? That, oh, well, let's leave him alone. This well, wasn't a I'm, pick on Shane kind of thing. Well, I'm just saying, how do you go from from doctor to doctor of Walmart? ECW, nevertheless, ECW, ECW. Well, there we go. Go back to the biography. Also on SmackDown, um, L.A. Knight was still calling out Logan Paul, but Escobar came out also, or instead rather. Because Escobar is pissed that L.A. Knight was looking past him to go to a U.S. title match with Logan Paul because L.A. Knight wants to get the Money in the Bank briefcase and cash it in on Logan Paul. And Escobar says, you're going to have to deal with me next week because they're going to have another three-way to qualify for this six-way. And then Logan Paul beat up Escobar, but then, or I'm sorry, L.A. Knight beat up Escobar, but then Logan Paul hit the ring and knocked out L.A. Knight with his mighty right hand while Escobar had completely disappeared. I wish L.A. Knight was in the main event stuff with the bloodline. I just feel like the fans want him in the main events and he's kind of being held, like someone's holding onto his feet as he's floating up. Yeah, there's nothing happening that's new from week to week with him. He's talking to us, and he's doing all of his shit, but they're not doing anything with him. And I mean, I know with Logan Paul is not exactly a goddamn preliminary spot. He's the U.S. champion and blah, blah, right. blah. But right. That's not what I'm saying. But just... L.A. LA Knight himself is just not doing things from week to week that one would think would be taking him up a notch. They put him at the top of the card with Roman at the end of last year, I think, and the fans accepted it. They were into him. And then he's just kind of been running in place ever since. And it's not his, his fault, obviously. It's WWE's creative plans. <sighs> but there you go. There were some of the other things that happened on SmackDown. But altogether, once again, if you got rid of those pesky wrestling matches, what a great wrestling show. And, say, and I'm not even, you said it and you weren't joking and I'm not joking. The matches is kind of like easy, get out of it. It's filler in the middle because we want to see what these stars are going to do to each other, with each other, and set up the big matches that we really want to see at the big show, which is kind of like what TV wrestling was since the dawn of television. But they've got the stars and the issues over and ever with Drew McIntyre and Punk. Everything has made sense, but nothing has been predictable or boring. But it, it's not, you know, oh my God, I can't believe that happened because it didn't make any sense. No, it, it's, it's, it's so they're cooking with all these people. Hey, the only thing though, let me ask you this and then we could uh, end this review. Just the whole tease with Paul Heyman and Punk about the bloodline coming for Punk, and obviously they're not the ones who got him. Someone else was looking for him, and that made perfect sense. What do you think that is, though, in terms of a long-term tease? I, th I think that uh, Punk and Paul probably know that at some point it would be great if they can work together again in some fashion. And at this point, it could be up in the air. I think Paul may be a babyface before... Punk is a heel, but so why not keep planting those seeds and play off the Hall of Fame thing? And Punk was sitting with his kids, and they do a history in front of the camera, and uh, blah, blah, blah. But you could tell the way the people are starting to react. Paul could very easily become a babyface by just saying and doing a couple of things in the middle of this issue. So, but at the same time, then you also know never to trust Paul. It, it, I mean, in, in storyline. Possibly other people know that in other lines. But so if Paul was to get with Punk as a baby face, could Punk trust him and the people would be nervous about it? You'd ask questions. I, You know, I think Paul will end up being a baby face out of this uh, between now and next year somehow. And uh, and can you imagine that face being portrayed in any way as a baby? A baby what? Baby fucking hippopotamus? You see, there was no reason for you to go and start insulting him here at the very well, end. Well, it just came up when I was thinking of that terminology. I'm like, how in the world would you describe 
That would be insulting to babies ac across the world of all species, wouldn't it? All right, that was SmackDown, ladies and gentlemen. Another edition of SmackDown, one of a, a really good edition of SmackDown, and we'll see what next week has in store for us. Yes, but we got more Punk and McIntyre. The Samoan werewolf is here. The bloodline is heating up. Cody's more over than ever before. If they just quit trying to force these fucking wrestling matches down our throats, we'd have a great program.